Hi, welcome to another episode of Talking Tax with Alex. In this episode, we're going to be wrapping up our tax crime series. This is going to be the final episode of that series, and we'll come back to it and we'll do another series later. In our next episode, we will resume our single case and in depth analysis of a single case and single issue um, that we had been doing previously. So on the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing differently uh, just in this series. We'll continue on our list of multiple cases and reviewing tax crime cases. And then we'll finally get to the brazen and the foolish, um, in my opinion, the most stupid and the most uh, bold cases that came out of this list. And then we'll end it with some closing thoughts, just you know, things that I've, I think about that we should uh, consider uh, at the end of analyzing a whole bunch of crime. So just a quick introduction, and hopefully it's not new uh, in relative to the, the series, but I do have the additional information of the court cases available on this screen for me, so if I'm looking away from the camera, that's what I'm going to be doing a little bit differently as well. And like I said, this is the third part and final of our tax crime series for this block, and uh, this block of cases, and then we'll, we'll resume a single case analysis on our next episode. So continuing with our look at tax crime, um, this case involves a Louisiana woman sentenced to 40 months in imprisonment for a conspiracy, conspiracy to defraud the U.S. So it was a tax preparer who inflated tax refunds, uh, claiming false income, withholdings, and education credits, and she did it over many different clients to the tune of about $280,000. And so um, she was charged, uh, doesn't say how long, she, oh, 40 months in prison, obviously. <laughs> and she was released, uh, three, she has three years of supervised release when she gets out and has to pay the $280,000 back. So, um, you know, it's kind of a long time to, to serve for preparing for on tax returns. So she's been doing it for a while, obviously. and. You know, it seems like a pretty fitting sentence for, for what she's doing. That brings us to our next case. Uh, this is a case about a Newark family that was sentenced to prison for conspiring to defraud and committing tax evasion. So this family operated three coffee and donut shops and concealed about four and a half million dollars in cash sales from 2012 to 2017. So um, I know that it's a common trope in the world that um, you know, you might have heard somebody who, who doesn't report their, their cash sales or, you know, they do an all cash business. It's very, mm, it's very uh, general knowledge. It's illegal, by the way, but it's very general knowledge that people do this. And in this case, this family got caught doing it and they're going to prison for it. Um, they evaded more than $2 million in individual and corporate tax, taxes paid, and they did so by among other things, depositing cash directly into their personal bank accounts instead of the business bank accounts, so they commingled funds. They provided incomplete information to their accountants, causing their accountants to file false individual and corporate tax returns, and funding personal expenditures directly with undeposited, un unreported cash. So they used all of this cash off the books to live a very lavish lifestyle, including multiple luxury vehicles, expensive watches, investment accounts, and real estates. They also paid employees off the books with cash wages for overtime hours and paid other employees entirely off the books with cash. So I think we all heard this story before. I, I, I've heard this story before. Um, it's kind of a, a trope for a reason. And in this case, this family just got caught doing so. And this is actually one of the few cases where um, the tax preparers are not on this list for being the bad guys. Because in this case, the family provided the tax preparers with incomplete information. And in that way, you know, tax preparers, you know, and, and as a tax preparer, um, you know, the bar for me accepting information from clients is good faith. I, I'm not an auditor. I don't need to verify that everything is accounted for. Um, so long as everything seems about reasonable. Again, that 
I'm not here to judge whether, you know, that account could have, should have, would have known because, you know, here in hindsight, we can see, wow, you know, if you, you didn't report four and a half million dollars of cash, how did you not see that? Um, but uh, on the other side of things, if taxpayers are not forthcoming and they're just, they're giving you sets of books that show um, a certain amount of money hitting the bank, bank accounts, the corporate bank accounts, how can, a, how can an accountant really know you know what's not being reported it's kind of like proving a negative so this is actually one of the few cases in our list that the tax preparer um, did the right thing I think there was another one where uh, the hotel manager um, father was trying to influence the tax preparer to lie and I, and I don't think the tax preparer did so so you know we've seen a lot of bad tax preparers in this case that's why I want to highlight you know this fact that this was the family because they were the family that's guilty they're basically providing uh, incomplete information. This, uh, the sentencing for this family laid out here is 30 months for the father, 20 months uh, to the mother, and 10 months to the son. So it kind of seems like the going rate here is a little bit different than what we've seen before. I mean, the previous um, case we just looked at, the Louisiana one, we got 40 months for about $238,000 of fraud. So kind of seems a little odd that in this case this is a two million dollars worth of fraud and you know the father is going to prison for 30 months and whatnot I think there's probably a little bit of bias if you're a tax preparer versus a regular business owner um, you know the previous case the tax preparer was committing fraud in this case it was a person committing fraud um, and you know you kind of think about it too um, the whole family is going to prison they're probably losing out on operating the business as well and, you know it's probably a little bit more than that and they're, they're gonna have to pay the money back so um, you know again I don't know how the courts work out punishments and all that stuff and I don't know what the going rate is for how much fraud you commit to how much jail time you get but in this case you know it does seem like the dollar value is a little high for what the, the sentence sentencing is um, given what this kind of fraud this was Moving on to our next case, it's a, a North Carolina man um, who prepared false trust tax returns resulting in about $5 million of refunds on behalf of his clients. So um, again, this is another bad tax preparer um, pre preparing and committing fraud, preparing false returns, committing fraud and getting fraudulent refunds. Uh, in this case, even one of these um, false returns a virus issued a refund check of more than half a million dollars. So this was a you know pretty decent chunk of fraud. Uh, the punishment for this tax preparer is, um, uh, I guess, an additional an additional punishment in terms of imprisonment. So after 15 months of imprisonment, this this tax preparer needs to serve three years of supervised release and pay $670,000 back to, in restitutions. So, um, yeah, this another case, another bad tax preparer um, committing fraud. I guess this seems like a reoccurring theme here, and it seems, uh, it seems like the people that feel like they know the rules can bend them and break them and get away with it, and I guess it works until it doesn't, right? And, you know, if this this guy felt like he is able to file false returns and make some money. It works one year, it works two years. He starts doing it multiple years and eventually gets caught, has to go to prison, you know, and then presumptuously uh, he's gonna lose his license too. So it's not just the prison, I guess, um, for fraudulent tax preparers, it's also their livelihood. They're gonna have to start over, do something else. So that that's pretty tough. Next on our list, this one is a little bit of a twist. So this is not just a tax preparer, but a former IRS employee. So I'm assuming former is after he got caught and sentenced. He used to work for the IRS and got caught uh, for committing tax fraud and since it's a 13 months for tax evasion. So a long-term IRS employee claimed fraudulent deductions on his returns and submitted fabricated documents to support the fraudulent deductions. So uh, we've seen this story on this list before, again, not in an IRS employee per se, but the idea of doubling down, um, you know, when you get caught for 
for fraud, a lot of these uh, a lot of these criminals are submitting fraudulent documents to support their fraudulent claims and hoping that they you know they get out of it you know someone will believe that and all I see is you know they're just doubling down making the punishments worse for themselves and in this case you know obviously this person got caught um, and in I think this one was a little bit smaller. Um, let's see, taxpayer caused a loss to the IRS of more than seventy-four thousand dollars. So again, this is a year and a month a prison sentence for only seventy-four thousand dollars. So you you know you can think of the going rate of how much prison time you get for how much fraud you committed. And I think the IRS probably went after this one, uh, this taxpayer, a little bit harder because he is an IRS agent, and so it's kind of like. Um, you know, it's, it's just like any sort of corruption within a, any government agency. It just leaves a real big dark mark. You know, we hear about corruption in, you know, the police department or something like that. This is very similar. So I'm sure they threw the book at him and made sure that, you know, this is probably the maximum amount of punishment he can get for, again, we've seen huge numbers of relative to the fraud, you know, half a million, millions of dollars of fraud. Um, and sometimes they're only getting one to three years. Um, you know the donut employees, uh, the donut fraudsters, um, the donut shop fraudsters in New York. Um, you know they only got what 30 months. That's like a little over two years for the father. So that was for millions of dollars. Uh, in this case, this guy is seventy-four thousand um, dollars, and he's got to serve a, a, a year and a month. I, I'm sure it's got to be because he was a, a, an IRS employee. All right, this case sounds very similar to our donut uh, and coffee shop employer, or uh, coffee shop owners, but I think this one has a di little bit of a different flavor to it um, based on the facts and circumstances. So this one's only for two years, and for two years, the taxpayers spent more than $1.3 million of business income on unrelated personal items, including home rent, travel, car payments, you know, um, living expenses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, why this one I think is a little different than the coffee shop owner that we just saw previously is this taxpayer was actually defrauding people. Let's see, they, they charge prospective fr franchisees a fee ranging from seventy-five hundred to forty-four thousand five hundred dollars to gain rights to open a store, and they misrepresented how much those um, stores were doing. So they um, these mis misrepresentations included um, that the franchise could get financing for the franchisees, the actual costs to open a franchise, and the number of franchisees that were already open or opening, as well as the profitability of the existing franchisees. So this, this kind of fraud was a lot different than like the actual com filing tax returns frauds we've seen. This taxpayer actually committed actual fraud on people and then didn't pay taxes on that money. So um, let's see, this, ta this fraudster sold more than 160 franchises and obtained more than $2.1 million in franchise fees. And so when he um, took that money, put $1.3 million into the bank account for this franchise, it was called New York Bagel. and then he spent that money on personal expenses and I guess the coup de grace of all this is that they did not file corporate or individual income taxes for these three years for 2014, 15, and 16 or pay taxes he owed to the IRS and so I think we we had a previous case where there was a gambling business owner operating an illegal gambling gambling business that got busted by the IRS for not paying his taxes on his on his income from that illegal business and so from the IRS's perspective, I bet if this taxpayer, you know, filed his income taxes, at least he wouldn't be caught for tax evasion. I mean, he would probably still be uh, in legal trouble for wire fraud or whatever if people were starting to sue him. But I think he accelerated his downfall by not filing taxes, and that kind of gave the IRS an easy access way to um, prosecute him because now they could just prove you didn't pay your taxes on any of this and you spent all this money that you illegally got on you know personal 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 expenses instead of business expenses which you know you're not allowed to do 
So, yeah, yeah in this case, um, in addition to the 42 months that he's serving in prison, he's got three years of supervised release and uh, $2.1 million in restitution that he has to pay back. So it's a, definitely, a, I think, a very fair, um, very fair um, judgment. And you know the restitution got to pay back the money, um, and if you're committing illegal acts, I mean at least pay your taxes. I mean I don't know. I, I don't have any advice on that. You know what? <laughs> Let's just not go there. Don't commit illegal acts. That's my advice. And that brings us to the end of the list. So kind of as a quick recap, um, and if you want to go watch previous episodes, the previous episodes of the series to get the full rundown of these. Summer of the summary of the list, um, please look at the link uh, in this video. Otherwise, I'm going to give a quick summary of what we did in the series. Part one, we started off with a Georgia woman sentenced to 51 months for her participation in a nationwide tax fraud scheme. So basically what that was, she her, her role was to prepare fraudulent returns of a big ring that would hold a seminar and tell people, hey, you're, you're a taxpayer or your tax preparer isn't doing it right, you're, you're owed additional deductions and whatnot. And so she would take those returns, prepare them, give them back to the people and say, you sign them and file them so that she wouldn't have to be, she wouldn't have her name associated with it. That's, that's a big no-no, by the way. Um, we also talked about three California men who pleaded guilty to $25 million of tax, um, tax and PPP loan fraud. So this was a... LA Los Angeles based tax firm that filed fraudulent tax returns for nine professional athletes and also fraudulently filed um, PPP loan applications and charged fees for those and then had a series of um, shell companies to to kind of like obfuscate where the sources of the money were, were coming from and, and to hide it and make it more difficult to trace. Uh, we talked about a Louisiana tax preparer who was sentenced to an additional 10 months for her second round of 10 tax fraud. So, you know, that's just, you know, what can you do? Uh, she, she was already neck deep in it and she, she went all the way. She decided to go for second helpings and she got a second helping of a prison sentence. The gambling business owner that I just alluded to um, who just didn't report taxes, his income, and the tax associated with running a gambling business, which is not even legal in the first place. And so he, you know, he got busted for tax fraud, not, not the illegal gambling tax business. We looked at a mission endocrinologist who operated his own corporation and got a little too loose with reporting his, underreporting his income, overreporting his expenses and uh, got busted for it. It happens to everybody. I, well, it doesn't happen to everybody. The temptation happens to everybody. Every business owner, I'm sure, has that temptation because now you have the control of what you want to report. And ultimately, ultimately, it's you can't give into the temptation because it's it is easy to figure out. Of it is easy to figure out. As an accountant, I can just tell you, you you know, we know what to look for. It. You know, however, however clever you think you are putting into shell companies or using cash to not report things, you can eventually f figure it out. Like it's not, it's not that hard. In part two, we looked at a North Carolina man who pled guilty to tax evasion, filing, um, filing. I think it was fraudulent trust returns again. We looked at a hotel manager sentenced to a year and a day. For filing false returns, this is this case is a little interesting too because the hotel manager and his father was, or sorry, his father owned the hotel and his father was trying to influence the grand jury and, and get witnesses to lie and get the uh, his tax preparer to lie, that kind of stuff. The hotel manager ran all of his wages. He basically um, lived off of a an expense account in the hotel and didn't report any income to himself. We looked at a home health care business who, or business owner who just didn't remit his employment taxes. He just straight up took the payroll tax withholdings and spent them on his business and on himself. That's illegal. Uh, we looked at a Utah tax preparer who pled guilty to tax evasion and obstruction. This was a case of a tax preparer who spent 18 years uh, 
not filing his own taxes, not reporting his own income, finally got caught in audit and then started trying to get his kids to obfuscate the uh, investigation, to hide assets and income, make payments, all that stuff. Crazy, crazy. Um, and then we looked at a Georgia man who got sentenced to 19 years uh, for filing false returns. Oh, so this was the this was the taxpayer who filed false trust returns. The North Carolina man, uh, the first bullet here, um, he he lied on his W-4 employment withholdings and said he was exempt from withholdings and got busted for payroll tax uh, for not making for not paying his payroll taxes. And the Georgia man for 19 years. So this, I think, this is the biggest sentence that we we've seen um, in our list. Uh, I think because the dollar values were so high, and he filed like 15 fraudulent, um, 15 fraudulent trust returns, and got I think five million dollars of of fraudulent refunds that way. And finally, part three, we just went over it um, in this video. We looked at a Louisiana woman sentenced to 40 months for just filing what I call regular fraud, just over, over reporting credits and withholdings and underreporting income at you know it, it's kind of boring regular fraud uh, we look at a new the New York family that spent a lot of cash or sorry that hid cash um, sales from their accountants and didn't and, and then obviously didn't report it and then used that unreported cash to pay employees off the books and to buy themselves luxury vehicles and live a lavish lifestyle we looked at a North Carolina man, a North Carolina man um, preparing false trust returns. who got 15 months, um, I think, to the tune of maybe a couple million dollars of false returns. We looked at a former IRS employee that got the book thrown at him uh, for sentence to 13 months for tax evasion. And we looked at a bagel company owner who was sentenced to 42 months for tax evasion and wire fraud. And his crime was more, I think it was more on the fraud side than tax evasion. I mean, he got caught because he didn't file taxes for committing the fraud, but he was effectively defrauding potential franchisees and franchi yeah, franchisees and just misrepresenting and lying to them about how, you know, how profitable it is and how many there are and just basically giving them a, a dirty sale. So that concludes our three parts. And I want to talk about my opinion for the most brazen of these cases, I think, was the three California men uh, in Los Angeles that filed the fraudulent tax returns on behalf of nine athletes and committed PPP loan fraud. And here's why. So they filed fraudulent income tax returns for nine professional athletes. And they said that they were the, they were the guys to do this for, for these. They, they built the trust because they said that, you know, look, we know more than your previous your previous CPAs, your previous advisors. We know about these strategies and these loopholes that they didn't take advantage of. So they convinced these athletes to not only file their current year income tax returns, but also go back and file amended returns. And then they charged them 30% um, of the resulting refund. And so, you know, that's, I mean, that's pretty bad. They, you know, they, they built this trust and they really abused it. And then on the same, in the same year, in the same breath, they, um, oh yeah, they directed the athletes to send their fees to shell entities instead of you know paying their actual company. But in the same breath, in the same year, they applied for fraudulent PPP loans with companies that had no few or no employees, and then they charged a fee for 30% of the loan received. So, you know, this one just smells bad, especially as a professional tax professional myself. Um, Typically, services are not allowed to be sold as a percentage of what the result will be. Um, that's an ethical, like an, an actual, it's called Circular 230 for, for accountants, and it's an actual ethical like thing that we're, it's illegal too. It's like an ethical, legal, like binding uh, ruling thing that we have to abide by, and you're not really allowed to do this. So the fact that they're charging fees for the amount of loans received um, you know, that, I mean, that's just wrong on so many levels. Then they directed these businesses that they pay, that they got these fees, um, that they got these PPP loans for to have the fees paid through 
a cashier's check and then write on the memo as payroll and pay those to other shell companies to try to make this all difficult to trace. And they face a maximum of five years for conspiracy and 20 years in prison for money laundering. So I think the this of all the cases we looked at, I, in my opinion, this case is the most brazen, the most bold. Like these, these guys are tax professionals and they should know better and in fact they do they thought they knew better than the rules and they could just skirt around it with shell companies and trying to mislabel documents and make it really hard to trace but uh, you know at the end of the day i'm really glad they got caught you know the ppp loan um money the you know the way that it was you know dealt out and, and handled by the government wasn't great but um you know, people that are taking advantage of it, you know, obviously need to get what's coming to them. So I'm, I'm really glad they got caught for this, but I think that they were probably the most brazen um, offenders on this list. The most foolish on this list, I think, is the former IRS employee um, sentenced to 13 months for tax evasion. I, when I read this case, um, it just, it got, <laughs> I can't help but just think about how it went down. Um, you're just trying to imagine the story of, of how this how this happened. But some, some highlights that I wanted to bring out is, so yeah, he claimed false deductions and expenses on his tax returns um, that were associated with his rental properties. And then he created fictitious real estate taxes on his personal residence. He fabricated charitable contributions on his tax returns. He deducted a false U.S. Army Reserves expenses, so he wasn't even, uh, he, he used to be on the U.S. Army Reserves, but then he tried to take additional false expenses, claiming that they're related to his service at the time, but, you know, obviously it was false and he didn't, couldn't do that. Uh, then he doubled down and he submitted fabricated, uh, he fabricated and then submitted these documents to the IRS auditors. And then he fabricated receipts from the church uh, for charitable contributions. And then he fabricated invoices from a contractor and a letter from the Department of the Army to support all of these deductions. So again, in my mind, when I'm trying to think of how this story went, I can just imagine this, this IRS employee who thinks he's, he knows the rules and systems so well that he can get away with it. And we've heard this story before. He doubled down, never doubled down. If you're getting caught, just accept your fate because I, I think he got a worse sentence and the going rate of his prison sentence was made even more, uh, was, was even harder because he, he, they were making an example out of him. He, they were trying to get the corruption out of their own, their own um, department. So I think this is the most foolish case that we've read. Uh, the rest of them range from what I consider your average tax fraud preparer, uh, your average tax fraud, your boring tax fraud from preparers just over withholding or claiming over withholdings or filing false returns. You know, in my world, that's not as a tax preparer. Like I can't fathom that that's really that weird. Um, you know, and I think we've heard, you know, cash businesses that are underreporting their sales. You know, all of that is kind of like known in in the world as existing, but. Um, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of different to see somebody um, within the IRS or you know within the the system that they're supposed to protect and hold getting caught for being um, for being bad. You know, it's just like a corrupt police officer, right? Like I think there's something to be said about um, corruption within a department. Oh, and then the coup de grace of all this. He took these same documents and when he, he tripled down when he was not just getting audited, but then he got, you know, um, running through the um, IRS criminal division, he submitted all the same documents. He thought it was going to work. I think he's foolish. So that brings us to our closing thoughts. Um, I think the very first one is just tax fraud takes many forms. Uh, you know, it's... It, I think we've seen many cases, I think we uh, 15 cases of just different ways that tax fraud got caught, at, you know, from payroll taxes to unreported cash sales to um, lying on your W-4 to submitting fabric, you know, um, submitting false documents to running your all your wages through an expense line account um, on the business. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of ways that it can happen. So hopefully, hopefully we were able to see a different different um, angle of of this world 
one of my other closing thoughts, and I kind of touched upon it briefly, but I do want to take a moment to talk about it a little bit more, is to beware of percentage-based fees. So um, in my world as a tax professional, there's, um, like I said, we're, we're bound by something called Circular 230. And, you know, as a CPA, um, that's what we have to uphold. And we're not allowed to charge fees based on ex expected results. So if somebody comes to you as a tax person says, hey, I can file an amended return for you and I will just charge you 10, 20, 30% of your refund. They can't actually do that. However, there is a different sector in the tax preparation world called credits where credit firms that are not actual tax preparers and tax advisors, they will only just prepare things for credits like research and development credits, workers credits, um, um, sometimes uh, solar credits or something like that. They can, or the, the hot one right now is the employer retention tax credit, the ER, ERC. Uh, that's super hot right now. Um, and there will be firms that all they do is that and they will charge you a percentage based fee and they're allowed to because they're not CPAs and they're not saying that they're actually um, giving you tax advice or anything. They're just going to be preparing just the credit for you. So I would still say be aware of that, um, but that's a lot more customary. CPAs are not allowed to just say, hey, I, I'm going to charge you a fee based on your refund or based on your tax savings or anything like that. And then finally, I think that kind of goes into always verify the tax advice you're getting. Um, we've seen a lot of bad tax preparers getting caught for refund or caught for fraud here, and it's usually because they're overstating or misrepresenting things that are on tax returns. So if you're getting tax advice and it just sounds really, really too good to be true, um, definitely just be cautious or verify um, that it's okay. And honestly, when I give tax advice, I I expect the same from my clients as well that they would sometimes want to verify what I'm saying, you know, this sounds a little too good to be true or anything. And that's where trust, you know, building up trust with clients and, and your tax advisor comes in because eventually, hopefully, my clients will trust me that I'm not trying to defraud them or lead them down something astray. I will even tell them, hey, this is an aggressive strategy, you know, proceed at your own risk or what's your, what's your risk of appetite for this? Like, how do you feel about taking this position? How would you feel um, if you got audited, if it's just a 50-50 shot? you know, what do you think about that? So, um, yeah, I think oh, it's always a good idea. Verify the tax advice um, that you receive. So that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tax with Alex. Like I said, this is the final episode of this tax justice series. I'll probably do another one later, but we'll return back to our original um, singular case analysis. Uh, if you do like this kind of content, please like the video, subscribe to my channel, and comment or email me your thoughts. Uh, my email is down below. Comments on the videos would be great. would love to hear your, your feedback and um, whether the, you know, this kind of content is, is uh, entertaining or if you want to hear about some other types of topics. And with that said, thank you, and I'll see you on the next episode. Bye-bye.